we are going to jump in basically exactly where we ended up yesterday. I mean, I forget the exact, uh, the exact example we were looking at, but what we were doing yesterday <coughs> was we were looking at solids or um, surfaces of rotation. So we have a horizontal line and we have a curve. And I'm just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that this curve never intersects the horizontal line. It can be above it, it can be up below it, but they can't pass through each other. And we're imagining a configuration where this curve is physically attached to the line via hinges, and we're taking the curve and we're rotating it. And its distance to the axis isn't changing, it's attached to the axis. It's just rotating around the axis 360 degrees. And that rotation traces out a three-dimensional shape of some sort, this kind of urn-like shape in this case. And we are trying to find the volume of this shape. It's admittedly a pretty artificial type of problem, not, not something I've seen real-world applications of. But in any event, we've said that someday I will stop doing that. In any event, we've said, okay, take the distance between the curve and the line you're rotating it about and call that distance the radius. So then the volume of this solid is pi times the integral. I always get sloppy and forget to label those. Pi times the integral from A to B of the radius squared dx. And yesterday, we, um, we looked at a kind of specific example. We looked at the example where this line was the x-axis, which is the same as the line y equals is zero. But it doesn't have to be the x-axis. It could be anything. <coughs> and let's demonstrate this, I think, just via an <coughs> example. Let's see. Let's look at the function f of x equals x squared around, well, let's do a few examples, around y equals negative 1. Let's start with on the interval from negative 1 to positive 1. So I'm not, I mean, we could, we could drag Desmos out or we could drag our calculator out, but I'm just going to, here's the line, y equals negative 1, and here's the curve in question, y equals x squared. On this interval from negative one to positive one. So, really, 
I mean, aside from the integration, and that's a pretty big thing to say, because we know <coughs> that integration can be really difficult. But aside from the integration, the trick of these problems is simply to find the radius. We need the distance from that line to the curve. And I'll give the distance between that line to the curve. It's x squared plus 1. <coughs> and then I'll talk about it. I'll say, okay, where's that coming from? And I mean, it's coming from this. Suppose you have a vertical line, and here's y equals 7, and here's y equals negative 3. And you want to know the distance between 7 and negative 3. Well, this is kind of pre-algebra to find the distance between two points. You just subtract the smaller from the upper. 7 minus negative 3. So here that distance is positive 10. We're just doing the same thing here, except that instead of having a number up here, we have a curve. x squared minus negative 1 is x squared plus 1. And once we found the radius, it's just, just is always in quotation marks in this class, but it's just a matter of finding an integral, pi times this radius squared. So pi, the integral is from negative 1 to 1 of this radius squared. And here the algebra is more tedious than anything else. I mean, this is a polynomial at the end of the day, and we know how to integrate polynomials. The only thing is that we know how to integrate polynomials in their standard form. So before we do anything, we have to foil this polynomial out. And at this point, the problem's basically done. I mean, I don't know even how I'll, I'll at least take the antiderivative. If it's one fifth x to the fifth plus two thirds x cubed plus x. But I think as far as where it's just ever so slightly behind, it's not a big deal. But as far as sticking one in there, sticking negative one in there, subtracting, you know how to finish this problem out. What about well, first of all, before we what about, does anybody have any questions about this problem? What about, let's keep 
y equals x squared. Let's keep negative 1 to positive 1. But let's change the line. Let's change the line to y equals positive 1. Here, again, we could, we could go to Desmos and generate these curves, but here is the line y equals 1. Here is the curve y equals x squared on the interval from negative 1 to 1. So suddenly our curve is below the line that we want to flip around. But this isn't going to fundamentally change anything in the sense that we're still going to look at the radius squared. Our formula is going to be the same. What's the radius here going to be, though? x squared minus 1 is 1. I'm hearing x squared minus 1. Any other thoughts? It'll be 1. And I'm hearing 1. So let's go back to this picture. The radius was the upper minus the lower. So when we go back and look at this picture now, this line is the upper bound of the radius. And this curve is the lower bound of the radius. So not x squared minus 1, but 1 minus x squared is our radius here. We are here's the interval we're looking at from negative 1 to positive 1. And again, once you've done the radius, that's, uh, that's half the problem. Pi, the integral from negative 1 to 1 of the radius At least it's half the problem in this case, because again, this is a pretty elementary antiderivative. And I know that's risky to say, you know, it's elementary to me because I've <coughs> taught this class for like a decade, but we'll foil this out. 1 times 1 is 1, we'll get 2 negative x squared, we'll get a positive x to the fourth. And this is a polynomial, you should be able to take this antiderivative quite quickly. If you're still struggling with stuff like this, come to my office hours, we'll find a uh, We'll find review material or something for you, but you should be able to take antiderivatives like this. So having said that, let's be extra careful not to stand here and botch this antiderivative. The powers all go up. And we divide by the new powers. 
and we're going to be evaluating this from negative 1 to 1. Let's see. <clears throat> we stick in 1 here, 1 minus 2 thirds, plus 1 fifth. We stick negative 1 in here, negative 1 plus 2 thirds minus 1 fifth. You could plug this into your calculator to get the decimal approximation. <clears throat> Let's do a more interesting. Interesting is maybe pushing it. Let's do a somewhat more intricate example. Um, let's let f of x equal 1 divided by x on the interval from 1 to 5 around the line y equals 1. <clears throat> and then sort of assuming we all know what, what quadratics look like, but maybe we'll take the time to Share this. So here's f of x equals 1 divided by x. We're on the interval from 1 to 5. And there's the line y equals 1. So, it's important to know what the picture looks like, because it's important to know where the function is in relation to the curve. Here, the function was below, I mean, where the function is in relation to the line. Here the function was below the line. Here the function was above the line. So as far as finding the radius, it's the upper minus the lower, so 1 minus 1 over x. And we're at least now in a position to, uh, to set this up. <clears throat> Let's use a darker ink. The integral from 1 to 5, we've got pi. And then we've got the radius, 1 minus 1 over x. Squared dx. And I mean, probably 99 times out of 100, when you do this problem, you're just going to have to simplify that square. I mean, because this is u substitute, I mean, this is composition, right? Every time you do one of these problems, where you have the radius squared, you have the inside function, and you have the outside function. 
And the only way we know of dealing with composition is U substitution. But U substitution is basically never going to work, because to use U substitution, we need the derivative of the inside function floating about, and you see we never have that just have the inside function squared. So, since we don't have any general way of integrating a composition, our method is usually going to be expand this so it is no longer a composition. So, don't be intimidated by anything. These might not be nice uh, polynomial terms, but we're just foiling this out. One times one, then one times minus one over x. 1 minus 1 over x times 1, another minus 1 over x. And then finally, a minus 1 over x times a minus 1 over x. A minus times a minus is a plus. And there, uh, not simplified really, but there is the integral that we need to take. <clears throat> not mean to press undo, no harm done, I guess. What I was trying to do was to give us space to work. This simplifies, I mean, that one is just a one, but we've got minus one over x, and then we've got minus another one over x. So that's minus two over x. And then one over x squared. That, uh, that might look harder to integrate than it is, because it looks like we have a composition. Maybe we have to use U substitution. But a fraction squared is just the top squared over the bottom squared. And one squared is just one. And we can integrate, we can find each of these antiderivatives. It might not uh, be obvious just because antiderivatives, geez, that was like a month ago by now, so we might not still be totally in the swing of things. Let me... Let me rewrite this one more time to make the antiderivatives easier. We've got the pi, won't worry about that until the end. The one and the five, won't worry about that until the end. One is five. The antiderivative of one will be x. No uh, trouble there. 2 over x is 2 times 1 over x. The antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log, and constants just sit there. So that 2 isn't hurting anything. 
1 over x squared is x to the negative first. And we'll deal with it like any other power. Bump the negative 2 up and then divide by it. Is everyone with me? Does anybody have any questions about this? I guess I waited pretty long into this question to ask, but about earlier parts of the question too. Then if not, that pi will just sit there. 1 turns to x, that 1 over x turns into the natural log. Again, constants just sit there when you integrate. Okay, x. We bump negative 2 up by 1. This is something that still sometimes gives Calc 2 students problems. If we bump negative 2 up by 1, it turns into negative 1. And then we divide by that new power. Well, 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. And 1 or something thus a negative is the same as having <clears throat> subtraction. Did everybody follow that? Then 1 and 5 go in. Suppose we should maybe do okay. x minus 2 ln minus 1 over x. I'm not going to worry about the pi for the moment. So we plug 5 in here, and I lamentably forgot my notebook paper, which means it's going to be back and forth. 5 minus 2. Remember that this absolute value just makes negative stuff positive. So the absolute value of 5 is going to just be 5. Minus 2 times the natural log of 5. And then, okay, this calculator wants us to close that parenthesis. And then I guess x to the negative first is 1 over x. So in terms of our calculator, we could enter 1 over 5, or we could enter 5 to the negative first, whichever we think is quicker and easier, minus, and then it must have been 1 minus 2 times the natural log of 1, this is, let me just one last time, this is subtraction, yes, this is subtraction, minus 1 to the negative first. You can simplify these things, you know, in your head, if, I mean, if you're able to. 
like maybe you recognize, okay, one over one is still one. Maybe you happen to remember that the natural log of one is zero, so this term isn't doing anything. I'm just plugging everything in. We press enter. This is not our answer because at the start of this, I said I'll just forget about pi for now, but we don't actually want to forget about pi. So if we, if we just type time is so, you, I don't know how comfortable all of you are with your calculator. When you do something like this, your answer gets stored in the calculator. In particular, it gets stored in the calculator as ANTS, A-N-S for answer. And if you now type times, your calculator will intuit that you want to take this number and multiply it by something. We've, in the quizzes, we've been keeping three decimal places, 4.967. Let's have you do a problem. Let's see, an easy problem or a harder problem. Let's be ambitious. Let's say f of x equals the square root of x on the interval from 0 to 1 let's say, around y equals negative 2. This is something we should be able to do. Um, when you're integrating, if you've forgotten this, remember that the square root is x to the 1 half, so we can integrate the square root. Just bump the one half up to three halves and divide by it. Let's take a look at this. So we've got the square root of x up here. <laughs> And then we've got negative 2, y equals negative 2, down here. <coughs> so our radius is going to be the upper minus the lower. The square root of x minus negative 2. Um, and at this point, we can at least set up the integral, which, I mean, to me, setting, may, uh, maybe some professors will think this is heresy. To me, setting up the integral is the part that really matters, because once you set up the integral, uh, you can go to Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica or any number of computer algebra programs and just have them do the integration for you. So, um, to me, setting this up is the really important part because it's the stuff that you know, Mathematica isn't going to do for you. Um, we foil this out. <coughs> the 
square root of x times the square root of x is x. We have the square root of x times 2 twice. So 4 times the square root of x. And then 2 times 2 is 4. Let's copy this. And again, the reason I'm foiling this out, I mean, this is a composition, but we, if we tried letting u be the square root of x plus 2, we don't have du, we can't use the substitution. So foiling this out is getting rid of that composition for us. x plus 4, the square root of x, and then plus 4 dx. And as I said, my sort of hint to you is, okay, the square root of x, remember that that's a power. It's x to the 1 half. So, when you're, when you're taking antiderivatives, well, just like x to the first, you bump the power up by 2, and then you divide by 2. We bump the power up by 1. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And we divide by this new power. And the antiderivative of 4 is 4x. Um, we probably, when we enter stuff into our calculator, we're probably going to get it's probably pretty awkward to enter 4 divided by 3 divided by 2. So maybe it would be better. I mean, our calculator won't care if this is simplified or not. But maybe it will be easier for us if we multiply top and bottom by 2 and turn this into 8 thirds. And then it's always an act of mercy to give these ones and zeros as our limits of integration because they're the nicest limits of integration most of the time. We plug one in, we get one half plus eight thirds plus four. We plug zero in, we get 0 plus 0 plus 0. And, I mean, I never know quite how fast I should go. I mean, 1 squared is 1. 1 times 1 half is still 1 half. Likewise, 1 to the 3 halves power is just 1. 4 times 1 is still just 4. And... We could, I suppose, do this in our head, but this calculate um, this pi is going to end up giving us a decimal anyway. So one half plus eight thirds plus four. One half plus eight thirds plus four times, where is suddenly, there it is, times pi. So this is what I get.
as the Vogue. If anyone got anything else, maybe, you know, maybe I made a mistake, maybe you made a mistake, but, um, I guess that's a pretty useless thing to say, but certainly this is the right setup. The upper minus the lower, then we foil it out. We take each of these antiderivatives in turn, we plug one in, we plug zero in, and we subtract them. Okay, haven't finished this section. You can probably see another reason why I wanted to get rid of some of these geometric sections. They take forever. Um, but we'll finish this tomorrow, and then on to better things uh, next <coughs> week.